Well, grace and joy to you, family. I want to welcome you to ABI and another window to look through. Tonight, we are going to be uh, studying in the book of Genesis. That's right. Genesis chapter 30, Genesis chapter 30 verses, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 19, Genesis 19, verse 30 through 38. Tonight's title of our Bible class for this Angelos Biblical Institute window to look through is this, what sin will make you do. Did you catch that? What sin will make you do. This is part two from last week's lesson, looking at the effects of sin in Sodom. That's right. What a powerful lesson we have tonight, beloved. So let me do this. Let me open a word uh, with prayer for us and then prepare our hearts and minds as we have to hear what the Spirit of God has to say to us through the text on tonight. So thank you for being here. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much tonight for this gathering, for the brothers and sisters of ABI and all who will be participating uh, in this Bible class on tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for the privilege to gather every Wednesday night to study your word. We're honored and we're humbled that you would give us um, the mental faculties to understand your scripture as you have breathed on it for us. Spirit of the living God, thank you for this incredible opportunities. Would you bless my brothers who are pastors and serving in various capacities today, watch over them, Lord, in this troubling time and country. Many are losing their lives to the gospel for serving and trying to be obedient to what you've called them to do, protect and keep them and their flocks as they serve you by night. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tonight's text, beloved, Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19, verses 30 through 38, all right? 30 through 38. The Bible says, Then Lot, he went out of Zor, and he dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zor. And he and his daughters, they dwelt in a cave. Now, the firstborn said to the younger one, our father is old now, and there is no man on earth to come into us as it is the custom of all the earth. So come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. And it happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger one, indeed, I lay with my father last night. So let us make him drink wine tonight also. And you go in and lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, both the daughters of Lot, beloved, were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and she called his name Moab. And today he is the father of the Moabites. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of Ammon to this day, the Ammonites. Wow. Beloved, what sin will make you do. This text tonight is an alarming story. It's the story of what sin made Lot's daughters do. Because of Lot's desire to dwell in Sodom, it is now affected his entire family. 
Did you catch that class? You see, their thoughts are perverted, their actions are diabolical, and their desires have been warped. But they've gotten this way because of desperate times and confusing situations. You see, class, when, when I think about this text, it makes me understand. When they think of and plan, or rather what they thought of and plan to do comes from their memory of the place they once dwelled in. Sodom. You see, Lot now has lost everything. Remember that on last week? He's in a strange place. He has his two daughters with him. And they now both have an appetite for sin from Sodom. No one else has survived the culture. There's no life anywhere. And they believe that they're the only ones left and that it's up to them to repopulate the earth instead of them trusting in God. They were not that far from other civilizations. Uncle Abraham was a little bit further away from them, but they were not the sole heirs left on the planet. Yet sin convinced them that what they were about to do and what they did do was all right to do. So for the first point tonight, let me talk about this topic in this context. Sin in a new location. They're no longer in Sodom. So let's look at this. Sin in a new location. Now the Bible says in verse 30, then Lot, with the angels leading him, went up out of Zor. That's the place they let him escape to. And they dwelt, him and his daughters, in the mountains. For he was afraid to dwell in Zor. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Let's unpack this. Beloved, when we come here to this portion of the story, you and I know that Lot has been delivered from Sodom. God destroyed it, just like the angel said he was. There's no more sinful neighbors and no more vexing of his soul day and night with the Sodomite ways. I said, Lot has escaped and he's escaped God's wrath, but sin has crept out of Sodom too. You see, though he was free from the location, the longing of sin was even closer now than it was before. You see, his daughters, his baby girls, had taken on the ways of Sodom, and now they would bring them into his home. And here's what I want you to know. Sometimes a relocation from the problem and influence of sin is a good thing, but there is yet a problem of sin in the human heart. You see, class, you can move from your location, but if you don't change your heart, sin is going to relocate with you. I believe an amen goes right there. There is also in this text an element of desperation in the text. You see, these ladies are alone in what they consider as their new world. And they have seen no other man. Uh, they want to see the human race continue. So they take it upon themselves to play the part of God and fix their desperate situation. Have you ever been there? Do you know somebody like this that feels like their situation is so uh, glaring and so different? There's no way that God can give them the desires of their heart. And so they take it upon themselves to create a situation where they may get what they desire so much or so deeply to have. That's what's happening in this text. 
Well, we've looked at this first point as seeing in the new location. Let me show you now the subtle suggestion and lies that came to them in this new location. Verse 31 of Genesis 19. The Bible says, now <clears throat> the firstborn daughter said to the younger daughter, our daddy is old now and there's no man on the earth to come in to us as is the custom of all the earth. So come on, girl, let us make our father drink wine and then we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage or the name of our father. Check this out, class. In this text, we see the influence of the older daughter impacts the mindset and the thinking of the younger daughter. <clears throat> this older daughter, her ways are corrupt. She attempts in this verse to influence her little sister to believe and to speculate like she did. Listen to her words. Our father is old and there are no more men left on the whole earth. Did you catch that? What she meant was, there are no more men who know Sodom, but our father. That's what she meant. Did you catch that right there? You see, the girls entertained the lie that they would never get a man again. Oh, yes, they did. The girls danced with the thought that the family name would not be preserved. And so they develop a plan to preserve their family, their name, their heritage through deceit. Lot's daughters, they've acted wickedly in that, according to this text, they got their father drunk and then did what they did to him. It was a plan, a deceitful plan, a scheme, a strategy that only they knew about and they dastardly pulled it off. Here's what I like to look at tonight. These girls used a noble thought, such as caring for the name of their father to do a wicked act. It was an act of deception, an act of drunkenness to make Lot now a partaker of their sin. Can you believe that? That's verse 31 and verse 32. Sodom was so much a part of their thinking, so much a part of their ways that nothing for them was out of bounds. And so when they get in this new place, the mountains of Zor, surround themselves and living in a cave, they take on this almost animalistic mentality about procreation. Younger and the of their father through inebriation, through his drunkenness. That's deceitful. That's wicked. And God was nowhere in this behavior. Well, we've looked at what sin will make you do. We've looked at the subtlety and lies that are taught and caught by sin. Let's look now at the sisters and their sinful sins. The Bible says in verse 33 and 34 of Genesis 19 class, so they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn, he went in and he lay with her. And he did not know, Lot did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Somebody ought to say that's a whole lot of drinking. Look at verse 34. It happened that on the next day, that the firstborn daughter said to the younger daughter, indeed, 
I lay with father last night. So let us make him drink wine tonight also. And you go in and you lie with him. That we may preserve the lineage of our father. Verse 35. And then they made their father drink wine that night also. <clears throat> and the younger girl, she arose and went in and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Now thus, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, when I read this passage in these two verses right here, 4, 34 and 35 of Genesis 19, the first thing we see is that when the first act of sin occurred, it had to be told. Did you catch it? The older sister couldn't keep it to herself. She told it to the younger sister. That's wicked. So why, why, why do you think that happened? Well, chaplain, I, I, sin has to be talked about. Did you catch it? Can never be kept to yourself. See, the wicked always want someone else to know about their deeds that are done in the dark. There is an enticing element among the world to participate and that which is forbidden. You catch it? So the older sister has to share with the younger. And then she invites her to join her and do the exact same wicked act that she just participated in. So much so, they both agree to repeat it the very next night. Why? So that the younger participate in it. Here it is. Seeing now in this passage has a strong hold on their minds. Oh, beloved, they did the act at night. Did you catch it? You see when the sin occurred, when darkness was prevailing, they did it at night and they did it under the act or the influence of wine. Strong drink. Oh, yes, they did. And guess what? Now they both shared a secret among themselves that would forever affect this family because of a sinful decision made on their part. They would never get this out of their mind. They would never be able to look at their dad the same way again. Why did I say that? Well, beloved, Sin is subtle, and it's subtle is and it's all encompassing. What do you mean, Chaplain? Well, it first deceives you into believing it's no big thing, and then it absolutely corrupts. I'm looking for an amen right there. So that if you do it once, you'll be compelled to do it again. Did you catch it, class? Did you catch it? That's how powerful sin is, and sin is not, beloved, to be played with. Well, we've looked at the sisters and their sinful secrets. Let me show you now how sin begets sin. Look in verse 37 and 38, and we're closing. The Bible says that the firstborn, she bore a son. She had a baby and she called his name Moab. And he is the father of that tribe called the Moabites to this day. Verse 38, and the younger sister got pregnant and she bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. And he is the father of the Ammonites to this day. Let's unpack this. Because you need to know 
what sin begets. It gets sin. See, because of this wickedness, enemies were now born to Israel. That's right. Did you catch it? These enemies, the Moabites and the Ammonites, are related to the Israelites through Lot. However, they would not be the seed that God would choose to bring the savior of mankind into the world. No, 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 no. These Moabites and Ammonites, these people groups, would end up warring against Israel all the days of their lives. They would be responsible for causing God's people great pain and suffering. That's what this sin caused in humanity. And this is powerful because, you see, this lesson, it could act as a warning for having children out of the union of holy matrimony. It could. Oh, yes, it could. Now, remember, these children were not a sin when they were born. No baby born is a sin. The sin happened in this case when the girls did this with their father. A baby being born is no sin. However, all babies are born into sin and shaped in iniquity. Did you catch that right there? It's never God's plan for us to have children outside of holy matrimony. I'm looking for an amen right there. That's not God's plan. No, it's not. God's plan is for a man and a woman to marry and to then give birth and have children. That's why it's called holy matrimony. Now, problems always ensue with the children of those who secretly plan to get them by ways other than God has allowed. You need to write that down, family. I know in our society, it's no big thing now. But let me tell you, it's still a big thing in the mind of God and according to the scriptures. And here we see problems emerge because of the way these girls did their dad in order to try and get themselves babies. Sin has messed things up for Lot. He's lost all of his possessions. He's lost his wife. He's lost his influence. And now he's ruined his daughters. All because of the sodomite ways they had embraced in their family. But even in that, grace has followed him and mercy has covered him. You see, these many lessons that we learned from Lot over this week and last week, they could have been avoided had Lot chose to travel another route, go the route the angels wanted him to go, but he had to live in Zor. Remember that on last week? You and I can learn a lot about Lot. But his journey for him, it has to be so. Why? That you and I might learn from his ways and not follow his example, but follow the will of the Lord. What a powerful text. I think about this in my mind. So many ways Lot could have probably avoided this. The angels wanted him to get out of Sodom and flee. They were perhaps going to lead him back to where Uncle Abram was. But Lot acted like, oh, I can't run any further. I can't go no further. I don't want to. He didn't really want to leave Sodom. Just let me stay right here, please, in this little city. It's just a little city. And the angels finally said, oh, right, whatever, go. Because we can't destroy this place until you get out of it. Lot wanted to stay as close as he could to the sinful situations 
and seducings of Sodom. And look what it got him. Sodom was destroyed by fire. His wife turned around and saw the destruction and was turned into a pillar of salt. Later on, he decides he doesn't want to stay in Zoar after all. And he goes up in the mountains. And in the mountains, his daughters have this mountain-like behavior, influenced by the sins of Sodom and convince themselves to get the old man drunk, that they may lie with him and have children. See what happened when you don't go the way the Lord prepares for you to go? Sin never wins. And it always pursues or produces other sin to follow what you've already committed. Well, I pray tonight that we have learned something from this situation. I pray tonight that we've discovered what sin will make you do. One, it'll make you make bad decisions. Two, it'll make you pay more than you want to pay. And three, it'll cost you sometimes generations. That's the power of sin. Well, thank you for watching tonight. Thank you for listening tonight. Share this on Spotify, it's there, Facebook, YouTube. Share this lesson, what sin will make you do, beloved. Genesis 19, verses 30 through 38. May the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray that you will warn your babies, warn people you know and love. Watch out for sin. It's deadly. Why? Well, sin was so powerful, it caused Jesus to come down from glory, to go to an old rugged cross, to die on our behalf. See, sin was so bad, it separated us from a holy God. And sin, in order to be atoned for, a sacrifice had to be made. Sacrifice where the innocent had to give up his life, holy for the unholy, died. That's what Calvary is. It's a place where sin had to be atoned for on the old rugged cross. Jesus gave up his life to die for our sins. That's how wicked sin is. It cost him his life. He died a brutal death that Friday on that hill called Calvary, a death unlike any other in the annals of history. He died, he was buried, and in the grave, he took the sting out of death, the scripture teaches us, and victory over the grave when he rose early Sunday morning, conquering death, hell, and the grave. That's why sin is so powerful. And that's why we needed the Christ. We need God who was more powerful than our sin to fix it and then give us victory and power over it. And now by the indwelling power of the spirit of the living God living in us, you and I can say no to sin. You and I can, can say no to the thing that wants to cause so much destruction in our world. I'm through. But when I look at what's happening in the world, the wars, right, all related to sin, the innocent lives or children being killed, kidnapped, preachers being murdered in their churches, sin. Sin is that thing that destroys mankind. And guess what? It don't discriminate. It don't care about your age. It don't care about your color. It don't care about your class. It's coming for you. And it comes to kill. The wages of sin is death. But the good news of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. He who has the son has life, but he who has not the son has not life. Thank you for watching, beloved. May you be faithful in your places of worship this week. May you support your pastor. May you get to him. May you tell him how grateful you are for him and his labor for praying over you and teaching you the word of God. 
And may you be a faithful witness to the cross of Christ in this dark and dying generation. I love you. Love being your teacher. Hope to see you next week if the Lord delays his coming. But we'll again come back and look at some incredible mysteries in the word of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a glorious day. Peace.